and Hugh. Okay, Hugh, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Fantastic. Great. Great. Shall I go straight off? Yes, please. Well, I'm going to try and share my screen to start off with. So, um, hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all. And I've been really enjoying dipping in and out today. Um, I live in Torquay in the English Riviera Global Geopark. Um, and I went down at high tide this morning and had a swim. There is the sea as I arrived at it this morning. Um, and it was really nice in Owain's thing to hear, hear him talking about the Bay of Fundy because there's a geopark in the Bay of Fundy. And I went there once and they have the reversing falls at the Bay of Fundy, which is when the tide comes in so rapidly, it appears that the water is going uphill. <laughs> and I did manage to see it, which is very exciting and being connected to the kind of extraordinary global geoparks movement of wonderful geological things that are happening. Um, so I, I go down to the sea every morning and um, what I'm going to do today is just talk to you for another couple of minutes and then play a piece of audio music that I made a few days ago, um, which has got me telling the story of me swimming um, with some piano playing that I've done and some um, recordings of a high tide that I did on Friday. Um, and just to let you know that it will, I think you'll appreciate it more with headphones when it comes to that piece. So if you have headphones handy, I think that piece would go down quite well with headphones. But just a couple of pictures before we go on. So this is from Corbin Head, where I swim when the tide is at its highest. It's the best place. And it's just an 11 minute walk from my house. Um, and uh, I'm just seeing if I can go there. And there, there's me in the water. Uh, with Siobhan and with Rick um, are there, uh, and you can see one of the um, one of the cruise ships in the background um, and um, that's Rick uh, who I go with him and his dog and we quite often had the swans as well this was a few days ago you can see here um, but I also wanted just to show um, this is a picture that Rick did of the humpback whale in the bay. And you can see it looks very similar to the previous picture. And um, during lockdown last year, it was very wonderful working with Rick. And we did a whole project about uh, different animals taking over the bay. <laughs> um, um, and um, Rick uh, saw a humpback whale in the bay um, and I wrote a song for it. And uh, so that was a very lovely experience to, for that. Um, he also saw kudu in Cockington and um, silverback gorillas on the um, Cliff Railway. Um, and uh, it felt like a very lovely rewilding of the bay happening during that time. Um, and uh, so um, from my window where I'm sitting right now, I can see this house. That's a picture of me standing underneath it. And this house is uh, William Frude's house. Um, and the last little thing I'm going to say before I play my piece is that William Frude, um, and f for those of you who can see me sitting here, um, next, he's sitting next to me on my shoulder, the bust of William Frude that we've had made, that William Frude is, um, was a nautical engineer who built the very first ever testing tanks in his house in order to test how ships move through the sea. And it feels very lovely that every day I go to swim in Corbin Head is just below his house. So there's his house. And there's just there's a little map here of the very first ever testing tank that was built just above the sea um, in Torquay in order to see what kind of prow moved more quickly through the water. And it was very extraordinary, the evidence he came up with, which is that, you know, that the, the pointed prow actually is not as efficient as a bulbous prow. Um, and he proved that by building a tank in order to test the movement of ships in his house above above the sea in Torquay. So I just wanted to um, to share that little those little few images with you. Um, and, and now what I'm going to do is ask if um, you could play the the um, the audio um, which I've made, um, which doesn't have a visual to go with it. So you could close your eyes. You could listen on headphones. Saturday the 2nd of January, high tide 8.10, Tor Abbey Sands, 60 strokes at 8.15, 
Thursday, the 7th of January, high tide, 12.13. Tora Bissans, 60 strokes, 10 a.m. Sunday, the 10th of January, high tide, 3.21. Odicum Beach, 75 strokes, at 10 a.m. Thursday, the 14th of January, high tide, 6.54. Torabi Sands, 90 strokes at 9 a.m. Sunday, the 17th of January, high tide, 8.56. Torabi Sands, 100 strokes at 8.40. Monday, the 18th of January, I live about 11 minutes walk from the sea. Tor Abbey Sands. 105 strokes at 9. The nearest place is Tor Abbey Sands. I walk down Falkland Road and then past Tor Abbey to get there. 108 strokes. Past the ponds where there are swans. Friday the 22nd Ducks. High tide, 12.20. Seagulls. Tor Abbey Sands. And a few more hens. 10 strokes at 9.30. Monday, the 25th of January. We live in the English Riviera Geopark. Tor Abbey Sands. Which is an urban area. 10 strokes at midday. Which is quite unusual for the geoparks. Because most of them are rural. Monday. So what that means is that high tide, 8.41. When I go swimming, it's next to the road. It's 10. If I swim at Tor Abbey. Wednesday the 3rd. So the sounds of the waves and the sounds of the buses kind of match and mesh with each other. At midday. And the sounds of the dogs and the sounds of the ducks also merge and mesh. 110 to 20 strokes it's 10 15. and I've noticed this winter as I've been swimming Monday the 15th of February far more people swimming than there ever were before 31 six facts about 10 years ago at 8 a.m. I wrote a poem about a man swimming in the sea in the winter Thursday the 25th of February and I ended the poem by saying I tied 446 maybe one day me 105 strokes at 8 a.m. and now I am swimming Friday the 26th of April, high time at 5.33 one, one of my sons strokes. gave me some gloves for my Christmas yeah. present and I bought myself some Saturday shoes Saturday the 27th of February high tide at 6 a.m. and I wear a swimming hat 110 strokes no, but otherwise, I put my swimming trunks on before I leave the house. Tuesday, the second. I make sure I take a flask. High tide, eight twenty-six. Of coffee with oat milk, seventy-five strokes. Or fennel tea, ten, depending on how I'm feeling. Saturday, sometimes the six. I take a banana or a sandwich, high or a piece of homemade cake. Eleven nineteen. Seventy-five strokes. At 10. I usually wear a hat as I'm walking down. Sunday, the I take a scarf. High tide, 12.34. 80 strokes. I love getting in into the sea. 10. Tuesday the night. High tide, 2.46. Any worries that I have. Eight tensions in my body. At 11. Go when I get into the water. And I swim out. 16th of March. High tide, 8 o'clock. And I count the strokes as I swim out. 100 towards the cruise ship. 9.30. That are still here in the bay. We've had up to the 17th of March. High tide. But at the moment, 30. There's two. 100 times 3. 11.45. Tall Rappy Sands. I never get very near to them. First of the 18th of March. High tide. But I swim out towards them. One hundred strokes. Yes, it's in the morning. That's towards the sun. And then I turn around second of March and swim back to the prom. One hundred strokes. At 
where I've left my clothes. I get changed. I have my drink. I put my warm clothes on. And I walk home. Eleven minutes. Thank you, you. That was gorgeous. You, you're gonna. I'm inviting you to stay with us just for a little while to um, help help me co-host because uh, uh, Anne Marie needs to go and uh, pick up her her son. Um, so, and we're all slightly in a state of. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what at this point, but we're doing, doing fine. Uh, so, thank you very much for that, you, and um, we will move on to Sarah who is has joined us and should be with us. Sarah, there you are. Excellent. Yes. Welcome. Hello. Richard. Richard? Yes. Sorry. I think Hugh might have a question for Sarah. Okay. I'm not sure if he's still Hugh, are you still on? Could yeah. you maybe I... ask your question to Sarah? I'm still on, but should I ask it at the end or should we just... Go on, it's a, nice, it's a nice segue. Go for it, go for it. I just saw a lovely link between your... Well, I, I, I saw some of your stuff, Sarah. Lovely to see you. And I wondered whether... Have you been in the sea for 12 hours today? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I've been with it, this background. This is yes. <laughs> yeah. I think this probably wasn't the question I was going to ask, but it's just like the amount of time that I spend in the sea, I think is quite different from the time that you have been talking about spending in the sea. So I look forward to hearing your story and uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yes. Well, I was just um, very moved by what you shared and um, and I can see why Anne-Marie wanted us to go next to each other um, because uh, a lot of the sort of internal musings that that were happening on the audio were very similar to some of the things that have been coming up for me um, with um, my current practice, which is um, I'm I'm sort of I'm I'm calling it water sensing, and I'm trying to um, actively train my body to be um, in touch with the tides at all times. So especially when I, I live in New York City. And so even when I'm in the middle of the city, we're very close to the water, but a lot of us run around the city and don't really pay attention to what's happening with the water. So I'm trying to um, embody from a performance perspective, embody what all the creatures that live by the tides um, what they what they do and what I imagine we as humans used to um, be I believe that our senses our sensory awareness used to be much more connected to the tides and so and I, I'm doing this as part of a, a way of um, trying to prepare for the future, arguing that if we can really get our senses to be back in touch with the tides, we will be better prepared um, for the for moving forward in the face of sea level rise and climate change. Um, and so on that front, um, that project, this is sort of a little portion of, of a bigger work that I'm um, making, um, that I've been making since 2013 called 36.5, A Durational Performance with the Sea. Um, it's an ongoing series of works um, where I stand in a tidal area starting at low tide and I let the water rise up to my chin over the course of 12 plus 12 to 13 hours and um, and then it goes back down again and it ends <laughs> at, the, at the next low tide and um, I've been doing this in different parts of the world um, I'm gonna share my uh, a time lapse from the I'm gonna try to share this time lapse from the Netherlands um, which happened in 2000 um, 15, I think it might be a nice segue after Hugh's beautiful music.
Um, so that was 12 hours and 46 minutes distilled down into two minutes. Um, and I'm gonna pop up on the screen oh, um, another, some, uh, some images too. So I can tell you a little bit more about the bigger scope of the work. Um, so the project began um, in 2013 um, in Maine, and it really stemmed from Hurricane Sandy hitting New York City, which was in October of 2012. Um, and when this happened, I just had this um, new feeling in my, like I understood in my body in a new way that um, our city was just as vulnerable as our individual bodies. And I, um, I just couldn't get over this idea that, oh, okay, ah, I understand now civilization come and go and that our city might um, be, my beloved New York, you know, might be wiped out or that we might all have to abandon the city um, within my lifetime. That was a new understanding for me and I felt it in my body and I kept on imagining a little artist running around the city trying to make ends meet while the city was just sinking beneath her feet. And, um, and that image stayed with me in this sort of parallel between the struggle for an, uh, an individual to survive on a daily basis and the struggle for humanity to survive in the face of sea level rise. And I kept on working on these ideas in different forms. And then I was at a residency up in Maine and I was, I'd never actually lived right by the tides this way and was just completely struck by the 10 and a half foot tidal shift. And um, one day spent about, um, you know, a few hours watching the tides rise and saw this rock that you see in this top left image here get covered over the course of like 30 minutes. It just like was swallowed whole. And I had this very sudden image of an of a person standing in the water um, and or standing in the in the bay and then getting swallowed by the water and then the water revealing again um, the changed body. So I, at first I my background is more as a director and I thought, OK, who can I convince to stand in the water for me? Um, and then realized pretty quickly that no one was going to actually do that for me. So if I wanted to make this image a reality, I had to stand there myself. So um, that was on a Monday and then Thursday was the day that I uh, executed this work. And um, and it, it happened. I was able to get through it. I got through all 12 hours and 48 minutes and survived and um, realized that it was going to be something that I wanted to do again. And it was terribly difficult and like the hardest thing I've ever done. But um, but I I really felt this need to um, to continue and realize that it was a series and really thought, okay, if um, if I'm this little person in New York feeling this way, um, what are people around the world thinking about and feeling in relationships to their body and climate change and sea level rise? And how can I try to understand what's happening globally um, in order to understand, you know, what we as individuals and global humanity can do about it? So I, I decided that I would um, do it in different parts of the world. And this is actually, and first I needed to understand conceptually what I was really getting to do in order to make it happen on a large scale. So this is in San Francisco, where I first um, developed uh, the idea of a human clock. So um, part, an element that happens now is that um, a, a person or several people that I collaborate with in a local um, in a local place will do some a performative intervention to mark the passing of each hour and that changes based on where I where I am. Um, this is the um, an image from the North Sea which you just saw the time lapse for um, and this was really what I consider the first full iteration um, of this work. Uh, I filmed the entire thing in real time 
and then turn that into a durational video work that's the same length as the performance. So the time lapse is really what I show to give people a tiny glimpse of what happens, but um, but the durational video work is the is is what I consider the the video output. Um, this is in Bangladesh in 2017. Um, and music became a really big part of this, this work. We have uh, Nasir playing his kamak, um, a recent refugee, Rohingya Muslim refugee, is playing his mandolin, and Sumi is dancing on the shore. Um, these were some of the local villagers who were watching as we filmed. This is in Brazil in 2019. Uh, in Bahia, uh, the Bay of All Saints. This is the Comunidade Solar de Union. Um, and Lev Brisa, who is a street poet, um, she began the performance with me by um, putting uh, some contemplate beads over my um, body to protect me uh, for Yemen Ja, asking Yemen Ja to protect me for the course of the performance. Um, these are some street poets who um, perform to mark the passing of the hours in Brazil. This is a nighttime shot. Um, once the sun went down, you know, sometimes it gets dark on the day that we have to do it. And so lots of people stand, um, were standing with me. I, I should have said that. I invite people to stand with me for however long they want um, and to come and go um, as I'm doing this performance. Um, this is uh, the most recent full iteration in uh, Kenya, um, in a village called Bodo, um, where the entire village came out um, to, to participate in the work. This is the very beginning, the ritual that happened right as I began um, the piece. Um, oops. There we go. Oh, here's um, As the Tide Was Rising. People are standing with me. Here is um, one of the hour human clock moments to mark the passing of the hours from the shore. This beautiful dance happened. This is at almost high tide. Kenya was great because the waters were very calm after Brazil, where they were very harsh and almost knocked me out. <laughs> We also expanded the work in Kenya to plant 700 mangrove seedlings. Um, as Depending on where I am, it's always very site-specific, site-responsive, and I'll try to incorporate um, as many things as makes sense to do um, in relationship to the performance. This is Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, which is also my background photo. Um, this is where I was when COVID hit um, in last year, <laughs> in 2020, I was at, had been on the ground for several weeks and we were six days away from the performance when we had to actually hold everything and, um, and postpone it. Um, and this is Amiria and Nedi, uh, my Maori collaborators, my guides um, there who have generously um, decided to enter and, and work with me on this, on this performance. Um, really bringing up a lot of amazing um, wisdom and indigenous wisdom that has now become very central to the work as I move forward. Um, this is the this the work in Aotearoa will be the eighth and penultimate work. The final one will happen in New York City. Um, it was also scheduled for 2020, but will now uh, both Aotearoa and New York City will happen in 2022. Um, I'm hoping to also, as part of that, be really connect. Um, the idea is to bring all these different works from around the world, bring them back to New York and with everything I've learned and to have reenactments happen in all these places um, where I've been and potentially other spots around the world. So for all of those of you who are in the UK, if there's maybe there's something we can organize to have people standing in the water on the same day as I um, do that final performance. Um, just to show you a couple images of the what the video work looks like when it's installed. This is the two channel in Oudekerk in the Netherlands. 
Um, this is a sort of site specific on the walls of Fort Jesus um, in Mombasa, Kenya, um, which I kind of brought up all these new things of the, this 14th century uh, building that has this dark history um, sort of showing the water rising on that building it was very um, interesting an interesting diversion um, and then this is like a four channel version where I'm showing both the, the durational video work from from the North Sea and from the Bay of Bengal in one um, open space and ultimately it will be a 12 to 18 channel video installation that's really collapsing time and space into one um, one room <laughs> and so you can experience it all at the same time um, this is my information I I would be so uh, excited to keep in touch with everyone. Everything I've heard from today is just incredible, and um, there's lots more video works on the on the website. Um, and yeah, I'm just it's so thrilling to actually participate in this title long event um, that you guys have organized. And because I this these are the things I'm thinking about and grappling with um, all the time. So I. Kindred spirits, thank you for um, having me, and uh, I would love to collaborate with all, any and all of you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. That was absolutely brilliant. It makes us even tighter now than we were before we uh, realized we were nearly through our 13 and a half hours. <laughs> I know. Um, I think we will have to move on because we are, we are out of time, but that was really great. Thank you ever so much. Um, Hugh, did you want to uh, ask a quick follow-up question? Yeah, well, Anne-Marie reminded me of my question originally, which was very helpful, Anne-Marie. And it was just really to, to say, Sarah, about when you, having spent so long in the water, do you, can you tell where, when you're getting near to a tide, where it is in the tide? Can you feel the tide out of the water? I think that's been one of the things for me about when I'm getting towards the sea, if I haven't looked at my tide timetable. Yeah, I think so that I've been, when I'm really deeply working towards the performance over those course, over that sort of three to four week time period um, in preparation, then yes, I, I like feel it. And my goal now, I've been thinking about this a lot and thinking about how I would like to feel it all the time, um, <laughs> even when I'm like in the middle of the city, you know? And I think that this would really help humanity if we could all reconnect yeah. to this. this um, I feel like it's a dormant sense, you know, that, that, um, that, or the people, when you, when you live right by the water or you are right by the water all the time, you do, it, it becomes part of your sensory awareness. But I really am sort of now thinking that we all need to get back into this zone um, where, where we can feel it at all times. And I think I've, I'm sort of failing in that, um, in in some in 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 feeling it all that like constantly, but I'm trying to train my body to actually feel it even when I'm not directly working on on the piece. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to figure it all out. How about you? <laughs> actually, no, I'm gonna stop you there, Hugh, yeah. uh, and uh, I'm going to welcome Margaret, who's done her own kind of a loving tribute to the sea by spending a year. Uh, on the water. Hi, can Margaret. You hear, can See you hear you? me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for putting this event together and bringing us all together. It's been so incredible to hear all of these stories about tides and um, I, I, like Sarah said, to be able to think about possible collaborations with other people who are sharing these similar interests and real passion for the water and tides and climate change is remarkable. And I'm just so encouraged to see all of this amazing work and experiences and sort of references to the sea. Um, as Richard mentioned, uh, I'm a sailor and also a photographer. And so my work about the tides and the ocean has been really influenced by my time living aboard my sailboat. 
I'm just going to share my screen now so I can share a bunch of images with you. Um, and so I'm just going to start today by talking a little bit about what living aboard a sailboat is like and how it has changed my sort of creative practice. Uh, this is my sailboat here, Bear. Um, when Sarah mentioned Maine, my heart started to flutter because Maine is one of my favorite places to sail. Um, I've sailed the entire coast of the US as well as the Caribbean and the Bahamas um, and explored a lot of the North Atlantic. And during that time, um, you know, I've really thought a lot, obviously, about tides, especially in a place like Maine, where you may come into a bay and six hours later, you may be completely on the mud, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so uh, becoming a sailor has really taught me a lot about um, not only sailing and thinking about my relationship to being on top of the water, but also learning things like how to um, predict the weather, looking at tidal charts, um, looking at the hurricane centers, uh, weather forecasts, being able to read those forecasts, how to provision a sailboat, um, how to become the refrigerator repair person, uh, the, the, the uh, sail maker, everything. So it's really taught me about sort of self-sufficiency and um, you know, how to live as simply as possible. Because uh, on 37 feet on a sailboat, you don't have a lot of room for anything extra that doesn't have a lot of you know, dual purposes. Um, so, Let's see. Um, so these are some of the, the things that I look at on a regular basis that are making me think about weather and tidal patterns and sort of what safety looks like uh, on the sea. And I am, you know, often thinking about the ways in which the tide relates to the wind, relates to the organisms in the ocean and relates to um, sort of my access to a next point of view uh, where I can approach the land again and start thinking about imagery that I might create. So here's just a couple of shots out sailing and I promise the, the whole presentation won't be about the sailing, um, but what I wanted to set up for you was sort of what my experience has been like of living on a boat. Um, from 2018 to the middle of 2019, I lived aboard my boat the entire time while I was on sabbatical um, and sailed from, left from the Chesapeake Bay um, on the east coast of the US, sailed up to Maine and then down to the Caribbean um, through the British Virgin Islands, the US Virgin Islands, and then um, the Turks and Caicos to the Bahamas and back to Florida. Uh, sailing can sometimes be a bit sporty. <laughs> um, but what sailing does is it affords me this different way of travel and this way to connect with the sea in really different ways. As I mentioned, both being on the water and thinking about it as a way of transport, but also being in the water and really developing a relationship with um, the organisms in the water, the animals, um, you know, sort of thinking about what it means to be human, what a post-human world might look like. Um, and I promise these, again, won't all be <laughs> images of travel and sort of vacation photos. Um, one of the things that really interests me is sort of being in the literal zone and thinking about how I can make work in those places in collaboration with some of the creatures that I find there. Um, so I'm often making cyanotypes, which I can bring on the boat and wash right in the ocean. But two projects I just wanted to briefly talk to you about are a project called Growing Light, in which I'm actually using organisms from the sea to create photographs. I am working with um, dinoflagellates, uh, bioluminescent dinoflagellates that you might find um, in Puerto Rico or several places around the world. Um, as well as Vibrio fishery, which is an organism that lives symbiotically with, uh, you know, with angler fish and these tiny octopus. Um, and I am using them to create photograms to sort of talk about our relationship to the sea and climate change. Uh, 
one of the most successful pieces from this work is actually about the idea of red tides. Um, and red tides often occur when there is this overabundance of nutrients in the water and a warming ocean. And in this work called um, Watershed Triptych, I'm imaging the three largest agricultural watersheds in the US, uh, which is where significant increase in red tide events have occurred um, at the edge of the ocean. So you see on the left-hand side, um, the Mississippi Basin on the middle, uh, the California Central Coast, and on the right-hand side, the Chesapeake Bay. And so that's one of my ongoing projects right now that I'm working on. And during the pandemic, um, I did not put the boat in the water, but instead bought a camper van and decided to travel to areas of the ocean that I had not seen before, including the US West Coast um, and the Pacific Northwest. And through this project, I've been thinking a lot about tides and time with the question in my mind, which came first, tides or time? And so I've been thinking a lot about the ways in which the littoral zone is again, continuing continuously like unveiling things to us, ways that we can see the movement of time, the change of time, the change of patterns. Thinking a lot about our interactions with how we enter into the sea as a sailor who's often on the surface of it, what does it mean to dive within it? And what things can we find? I also think a lot about the tides as um, sort of this um, thing that I am both fearful of and in awe of at all times. Seeing Sarah standing in the water made me think of many experiences where the tide just seemed to have so much power over both the organisms, but also the land. So I'm sort of thinking about time in these really broad terms, um, big geologic time, right? Deep time, um, both back and forward, right? What does the, what do the rocks at the edge of the sea know, right? In the same ways that we can study like dendrochronology in trees, what can the rocks teach us uh, about what has happened and what will happen, what oh. will happen? Sorry to interrupt, I'm gonna give you two minutes. Thank you, great. I'm almost at the end here. So um, this collection of work is, spans my relationship with the sea, like I said, from the Pacific Northwest through the Caribbean and the US East Coast. And I'll just click through these really quickly for you. The things that I found really interesting were things that people left as markers or almost talismans along the coast, um, often leaving these sort of altars that would be washed away with each tide. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my work. Again, I look forward to connecting with many of you and having continued conversations about the tide and time. Thank you, Margaret. That was a, a wonderful kind of romp through uh, many, many main parts of the, uh, the planet there and <laughs> the usual array of uh, gorgeous images. There's just some extraordinary things in there. Thank you. Great to have you with us. Um, and we have a change in program now because Tessa Grundon, who was due to join us from New York, uh, has not been able to. So uh, Godfrey Whitehouse has stepped in and welcome Godfrey. 
Yes, good evening. Unbelievable photos from Margaret there. I'm also a sailor, so I can appreciate what she's been doing. But I'm very much more local. I just like sailing on the coast of the UK, preferably in the River X, if I, as far as I can. So I've got a, a brief presentation to show you about um, potential tidal rise. And I'll just share my screen and then start the presentation. Now, that, is that sharing at all yet? Uh, no, Godfrey, we haven't yet. Try again. Okay. We're not, we don't, you haven't clicked the share screen button, I don't think. I shall click it again. Right, it comes up with a series of options, basic, whiteboard, safari, mail. Uh, you probably want basic and then choose the, uh, the file that you want to show us. Oh, I see, okay. Um, I'll just put that as a slideshow on my desktop, so it should work with my desktop. It should. Yes, okay, hold on. Okay, I'm seeing my slide. Can you see my slide yet? The first slide? We're not seeing it, no. Okay, just a minute. Maybe another button you need to click that says share. Yeah. Yes. Let's go back to Zoom. Right. Share screen. You should see, you should see oh, your yes. PowerPoint. Libra, I've got a load of LibreOffice um, options here. So let's try that one. Yeah, you should see the the PowerPoint ready to go. You should see the image of the first page yes. of the PowerPoint and click on that. I mean, you, in when you've gone screen share, you should see multiple versions of what's of different things that are open. Yeah. And one of them will be your PowerPoint if it's open, if, if it's already open. OK. I think I'm I think I'm really sorry about this, but I need to, it says, Zoom is saying I need to leave the meeting and then rejoin in order to allow sharing. Does that sound logical? Not especially, but um, you hmm. can try it and we can come, come back to you. Right. Um, We've got time, Godfrey, if you want to pop off. I'm very, very happy to do a little promo for my song, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. I, found the, I found the thing I want to share with you now. Let's have another go. It doesn't work on. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's amazing. That's good. So that's You'll on there. Right. Later. Slideshow. Start from the first slide. Right. Can you see that? Nice yellow. Yeah, yeah. you can. You can. Okay. You Great. Right. So here we go. So this is a, a, a brief presentation about what rise in tide has occurred and what might occur. So this is quite a common scene in Toksham and you can see the tide, the high tide is on the underway and I'm sure lots of you are familiar with this area um, and familiar with the potential for flooding and you can see that the houses in the background are quite at risk. Um, Sea levels in the UK are measured all around the coast, but by far the longest record is uh, at Newlyn in Cornwall, and the building on the end of the pier, particularly one of the huts and the tower, is the Newlyn tide gauge. And tidal levels have been measured there for 110 years. And I would argue it's possibly the most important building in the UK for, for tide lovers. And this is the recording so far. You can see from 1910, it's been rising steadily. And although the units on the left are not so obvious, I'll just tell you that the rise over that period of 110 years is 20 centimetres. 
But what's more interesting is if you look from 1990 onwards, half close your eyes, you can really see that there's a significant increase in the rate of rise after 1990. And this is why it's thermal expansion, ice sheets, glaciers, and all sorts of other contributing factors. Now, these three charts are three projections from the IPCC and also um, from other universities. And they cover quite a long period. And don't worry too much about the detail other than just to note that this is covering a period of up to 2,300, not the usual 2,100, and that the three scenarios, which of which a graph, one graph represents each scenario, are RCP, representative concentration pathways. The left-hand one applies if we really get climate change under control and we start actually reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere rather than hoping to prevent further increase. So that's RCP 2.5. And that's consistent with um, rather better than the IPCC target of 1.5 degrees. The middle one, RCP 4.5, is what would happen if the, tide, if the, the IPCC targets were met, roughly speaking. And RCP 8.5 on the right is where we're heading at the moment. And the one thing I want you to note about this is that, yes, by the year 2100, we are looking at a tidal rise of up to a metre. Look what happens in the year 2200 and 2300. You could be looking at a tidal rise, according to the Met Office in this case, of four and a half metres. I want you to think about what the implications of that might be. So we in Extinction Rebellion had a, a little protest about this recently, and this is again on the underway at Topsham. And you can see that um, we're showing a tide rise of up to 1.1 metres by 2100. I suspect quite a lot of you will know where this is. I hope so. Anyway, this makes it a bit more clear. There's the church in Topsham and there's our banner. And that's showing potential sea level rise of up to 5.4 metres by 2300. Now, I won't be around. I don't suppose many of you will be. But thinking about children and grandchildren and their children and grandchildren, this is what we are bequeathing them. And it really is the case that sea level rise is one of the most intractable things because once the sea level starts to rise and the temperatures start to rise, it's very difficult to turn around. And that's why all those projections show steadily increasing sea levels all the way up to 2300. And those estimates of sea level rise are really exceeding previous estimates. So the, the, the estimates keep getting higher and higher. And the, 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 the sea level rise is posing a threat to ecosystems. There are hundreds of millions of people around the coast who will be displaced by this sort of level of rise. Hundreds and thousands of heritage sites along the coasts of, of, of the countries around the globe and a terrible threat to land to land availability. Well, so I don't want to interrupt, but you're going to give you two minutes. Yep, that's fine. I think I'm done now. That's okay. as much as I wanted to show you. All just, right. just to be aware that when people talk about, you know, oh, it might be half a meter. Yes, it might be half a meter under the best optimistic projections by 2100. Yes. There's potential for very much longer and larger rises than that. Thank you. And as, as you say, it's probably one of the hardest things to turn around. Yeah. So, so if, I, if I was to say one final thing, 
I would just say that I'm terrified. For, I don't have children or grandchildren, but for those of you who do, it's a question of what, you know, what we're leaving for them. It's our CO2 emissions which are causing these rises. And we need to think what to do about it. My personal conclusion is that direct action protest is the only thing that's left to, to us to do. Great, that's a very good point to leave you. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, to go on to uh, Deanna. Thanks, Godfrey. Who is with us? Deanna, are you there? Oh, Pete, I was just trying to get in to say. Hello. Hello. Oh, welcome. Can you see me? I can see you and hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, first of all, for producing this event and hosting. I'm so excited to share a little bit of my experience of tides with you all. Um, first of all, a shout out to Sarah. Hello, Sarah, my fellow water artist. And um, it's really, um, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm an example of like what some she had mentioned, you know, we live in New York City, um, very close to the water, but not a lot of people have a really direct, direct experience of it. And I actually one of those people, I mean, up until, oh, I don't know, maybe a couple of decades ago, um, I had always lived near water. I grew up in Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. I knew the ocean was there, but I never went to the beach because my father hated it. Um, I grew up swimming in a pool, you know, um, so my experience of water is very, very profound, the sense of water, of being in water, what water means to us, psychologically, emotionally, metaphorically, um, it's always been significant, but the actual experience of water and of tides and how that affects our lives um, was only relatively recently clear to me, and it became clear to me um, after an artist residency in 2017. But first, I'm gonna try to share my screen um, and show you some of my work and images that um, may, okay, I wanna change this, hold on a second. Pause share, sorry about that. I'm actually a little bit new to this. It was a very nice image anyway. So bear with me. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try it again. Uh, okay. Great, can you see that now? Yeah, we can. Okay, awesome. So um, in 2012 or 13, I started making these drawings, which are based on rubbings of traces of wear in my, in my surroundings. Like, um, my, my work is mostly based on effects of natural um, forces on the built environment and of natural forces, not natural forms of all types. So these drawings were taken from rubbings of, of the deteriorating walls in my studio. Um, and then I would elaborate them intuitively. And so I made a series of these um, and it wasn't until I went to um, St. Andrews in New Brunswick in Canada for an artist residency in 2017 that I realized how connected my work was to um, actual forms in nature. I mean, I had always been looking at natural forms and water forms, but um, never deriving specifically um, from them as in observationally. So I would always worked um, in an abstract way. Um, so I went to this place, which is um, in New Brunswick, Canada, and it's a seaside town. And um, there the tides are, um, they change. It was really my first experience of extreme tides. Uh, because the, cha the change is 25 feet over the, over the day. So it was um, remarkable to me. And also there was an adjacent minister's island, which I would visit um, almost every day. And you could only access it via a sandbar, which was you know, um, available depending on the tide. So um, this is a view of Katie's Cove, where 
I collected a whole bunch of sea kelp um, where it just washed up, of course, all the time. And I know this happens everywhere, but I've never been so close to the um, to the water before. So I was really inspired by seeing these forms. Um, so this is a bunch of fresh kelp. I mean, not fresh, but it's it's um, collected from the beach. And so I I acquired mass of this and I took it to my studio and I dried it out and you can see these examples. And um, I realized or I learned that, you know, this stuff is everywhere, but <laughs> again, I had never had really um, direct encounters with it in the same way. And I found these so inspiring because they had resonance to my work and um, that they also, um, to me, the, the presence of the kelp on the shore is also making almost like a drawing. It's like it, it's tracing the line of the tide or, um, you know, I, I'm really interested in these ways that, that natural patterns are happening and that they, they inform us in so many different ways. So these are more images of the dried kelp. And when I got back, to, I brought it all back to my studio in Brooklyn and I made this wall installation, a temporary one. And um, just to see, you know, what would happen if I if I if I use these as a, a um, as sort of like their own forms and how they and how they ended up drying, it was it was just, just the transformation from the wet form to the dry form and uh, how much color was lost, um, how much shrinkage there was. Etc. And I also made um, a, a number of cyanotypes from the seaweed, um, which were, I believe these were all done in St. Andrews um, during that residency. Yeah. And I also was inspired to make a series of watercolor and ink drawings. Uh, which are based on the like sort of atmosphere of the coast and the tidal patterns, uh, the tidal forces. And um, all of these um, are sort of ongoing projects. Um, and I see, I also do a lot of collaborations. Well, I'm trying to do more collaborations too with um, other artists and scientists um, who are concerned with, um, I mean, different aspects of, of nature, but certainly um, climate change is, is, a, is an ever present kind of um, subject. So um, yeah, that's really about it. And I would love to be in touch with anybody who uh, would like to share more um, or maybe talk about projects to, to, to work on together. Um, I forgot to add a slide with my contact information, but my <laughs> website is uh, dianacelee.net. So you can contact me there. And um, I guess that'll be it. Thanks. All right, muted. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Very, very brief and to the point, but some lovely work. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was. I really particularly particularly enjoyed. Sorry, I'm losing. I'm losing the will to speak now. Um, I particularly enjoyed the uh, the seaweed sculpture on on your wall, which was really gorgeous. Thank you.